Well, hey there, everyone, and welcome to our podcast. This episode was recorded in our adult Sunday school class and features our longtime teacher, Miss Jeannie. We hope you enjoy this teaching. Now, let's get into the lesson. We're going to start early. I apologize, but Miss Pat wants to share her testimony this morning. She's been wanting to for a while, and uh, we hated to put it off any longer because it's a word from the Lord. And she's going to share first, and then I'm going to share this morning. We're going to open in a word of prayer. Thank you all for coming this morning. We've got some new people that have been in class this morning. We've got some people that have only been here for a few weeks. So y'all make sure you say hey and be welcoming. And I know y'all all love to sit in the same seat. I understand it. I'm in the same place every Sunday. I, I understand it. But try and get up and meet somebody sometime that you don't know. Okay? It's amazing when you find somebody that's from the same little town you are. A hundred long ways away. Right? That's fun. Father. Lord, we just need to slow down this minute. We just need to take a minute to tell you that we love you. And Father, we come together because we want to know more about you. We want to study your word so that we can be a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Father, when we get to heaven, we want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful. And so Lord, open our ears today. Open our eyes to your understanding. Father, some of us have walls that need to be broken through. Some of us have anger that needs to be overcome. Father, some of us have worries about money and about homes and about children, all the things of life. Help us to lay that aside and let this hour of time today be precious in your sight. Thank you, Lord, for a group of people that are willing to come out to worship you and to hear your word. And we give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Thank Pat. you. Uh, because I came, do you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. Because I came here this morning to give all the honor and the glory to my God, to your God, for all he has done in my life, for what he has brought me through, and all he has taught me. I have to begin my testimony some 40 to 45 years ago. We had already been married. We had two children, Jim and uh, Carol. On the surface, everything appeared to be going well for me. But there was something brewing on the inside of me. I didn't understand it, and I was afraid of it. I was ashamed of it, and I definitely didn't like it. My life was so good, and yet here I was, having such feelings of despair. I was beat. I had no idea what was going on inside of me, and I had absolutely no idea how to fix myself. Even with all the determination, Don knew I was hurting, and after a while, he suggested I tell the doctor. After I underwent a round of blood work and testing, the doctor sat down and explained what he thought was happening. He began by explaining that women normally go through menopause in their 50s and their 60s. However, in my case, my body was shutting down early, too early. It was shutting down at the age of 32 years old. Most women have the change, and it's a non-event. They expect it to happen. It happens, and then it's over. In my case, in your case, Mrs. Ward, I'm sorry to tell you that I believe that these early hormonal changes have resulted in a deep depression and how I hated those words. Even now, those words make me shudder. My whole body reacts to even putting it down on paper. But, my God, Jeremiah 29, 11 tells me, I have a plan for your life, a plan not to harm you, but to give you a hope, to give you a future. But Jesus tells me in John 10, 10, beware because the devil is out there to destroy me, to kill me, but my God has different plans. The doctor immediately made an appointment for me to see his, his friend, and with several visits with him, and many, many, he gave us two options. The first option was effective, but would be a slow process, 
with many doctor visits and lots of meds. The second option was quick, and we'd be back to normal before I knew it. That sounded so good, it, it had to be the answer we were looking for. That's exactly what I was looking for, quick and back to normal. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds, it sounded good to us too. And without doing any kind of research, without checking with or seeking any counsel or any advice from medical professionals, we jumped right into option two. Get it over quickly and be home with my children before they even knew I was gone. I thank my Heavenly Father that he had me in the palm of his hand, that no matter what the enemy had planned for me, my God would never leave me nor would he have forsaken me, that he was on my side and that I should be still and know that the battle was his. Our nightmare began the morning Don dropped me off at the psychiatric hospital in Buffalo, New York. I was so frightened, so scared, I, I wanted to run. I wanted to run as fast and as far away as I could. The next morning, the shock treatments began. There were 13 shock treatments in all. As I received more and more of the treatments, I found I was forgetting everything around me and everybody that I knew. I didn't even know Don when he came to visit. It got so bad that the day he came to pick me up to go home, I, did, I thought I was going home with a perfect stranger. I walked into our home and I didn't remember anything about it. I found that it wasn't just that I couldn't remember anything, but now it was, I was so very, very fearful. There wasn't anything I wasn't afraid of. Simple things like going downstairs to do laundry, fixing meals, planning meals, grocery shopping. The thought of going to a supermarket was like climbing Mount Everest. There were days when Don was afraid to go to work and leave me alone. Going down to the basement was a nightmare for me. But God, but God, he promised that he would never leave me or forsake me. I was still struggling with my issues until one day Don came home from work. As he walked in the door, he said, I brought you a surprise today. As he handed me a number of records, he said, I would like for you to play this worship music every chance you get. In fact, I'd like for you to play it the moment I leave this house until I return in the afternoon. And there's one other thing I'd like for you to do for me. I'd like you to sing along with the song. Now, if that wasn't enough, Don had another request. He looked at me and he said, I'd like for you to sit down and read your Bible every day. I couldn't concentrate on reading a little recipe, let alone God's word. What was he asking me to do? It was simply impossible. You could put that in the same category as singing along with those worship songs. God, help me. Each new day presented itself with a new struggle for me. Then there was this one morning. I got Don off to work. Jim and Carol off to school and remembered that there was laundry to do in the basement. But just the thought of going down to the basement terrified me. I had to build up my courage and even to reach for that doorknob, even to reach for that doorknob, I held on to that knob for what seemed to be an eternity when suddenly from out of absolutely nowhere, this song began to play in my mind. I don't remember where or even if I had ever heard this song before. As if I had known this song and its lyrics forever, I began to sing. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, I know he holds my future. And my life is worth living because he lives. What in the world, I thought. Where did this come from? I don't remember ever hearing this song before. I know I didn't know the words to that song, and yet here I was, singing that song as loud as I possibly could. And I sang over and over again. The more I sang those words, the more confident and less fearful I became. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Finally, fear no longer had any power over me. It had no authority over me. Jesus met me at that basement door, and I received victory over fear, never to be enslaved by fear again. 
Remember, Don had asked me to do two things. The first was to sing along with the worship music. The second was to read my Bible every day. One morning after loading the washing machine while singing my victory song, I came upstairs, sat down on the sofa, Bible on my lap, and I thought I heard a voice. I believe I may have stopped breathing for a second, waiting to see if I truly heard something, anything. And there it was again. This time I heard it loud and very clear. You have a choice. You have a choice to make. A choice only you can make. You can choose to live or you can choose to die. What was that? Who was that? What did that all mean? I knew deep down inside of me that it was my God. He was right there in that living room with me, speaking directly to me. And he was giving me a choice. He was telling me that I could continue to bury myself in self-pity, or I could pick myself up and give God's word a chance to work in my life and a, cha and a chance to change my life. I have absolutely no doubt that it was the voice of my God speaking directly to my spirit. At that moment, I looked down at the Bible and that was still sitting on my lap. And it was open to John 4. Looking down at the page, it was like verse 14 was in neon lights. Verse 14 jumped right off the page at me. And it was as, as if Jesus himself was standing in the living room and he was speaking directly to me, eye to eye. And it said, but if Pat drinks of the water that I shall give her, she shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give her shall become in her a well of water springing up to eternal life. Oh God, what does that mean? What are you trying to tell me? I don't understand. But then I knew deep within me that I was supposed to take that verse and memorize it. Remember, my mind was not well. It was hard, not to, next to impossible, for me to memorize anything. But God said I had a choice. I knew deep down on the inside of me that God was asking me to take this verse and put it to memory. Now, how was I going to do that? I began by writing down, writing the verse down on several index cards and kept them in front of my eye continually. I taped them on mirrors all over the house. I placed them on windowsills in front of the kitchen sink, on the refrigerator, on the stove. Everywhere I looked, I could see that verse. And I would speak that verse out loud every chance I got. That verse was my salvation. It took me months to memorize just that one verse, but I did it. Once I had that verse memorized, God gave me another verse to memorize. The new verse also came from the Gospel of John. Just as if Jesus himself was speaking to me again, the verse said, if you, Pat, live in my word, then you, Pat, will truly be a disciple of mine. You, Pat, will then know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He was telling me that the truth of God's word is powerful enough to set me free forever. Each new day came, there came a new verse. Each new verse became a new confession of prayer and thanksgiving. There was now so much I had to be thankful for. Each new day brought a new freedom in my life. My mind was and is being totally washed by the water of God's word. Every moment I spent in God's word made me grow stronger and stronger. It was a scripture promised in it was just as scripture promised in Isaiah. I gained new strength. I mounted up with wings like eagle. I ran with God and his word and I did not get weary. I walk now without fear and I'm not able to, and I'm able to accomplish all that God has designed me to be as a servant of the almighty God. One morning I woke up and I absolutely knew for positive that I was completely delivered completely healed, and I no longer needed meds. God had completed his work in me. He delivered me from the dependency of meds and, and the dreadful, and dreadful fear. He delivered me from the ugliness of depression and from the things un, that were ungodly. I will forever praise him 
and give him all honor and glory for it. Now, as you all know, I've not been to Jeannie's class for two and a half years. Some two and a half years ago, I was told that I had giants and I had enemies in my body that needed to be conquered. The first of many diagnoses was pulmonary hypertension. This condition occurs when the blood pressure in your pulmonary arteries, the vessels that carry the blood from the heart to the lungs, is higher than normal. The doctor prescribed the use of oxygen 24 hours a day. This was the beginning of a long season in my life that seemed like it was never to be over. Since then, there have been five hospital stays and the following additional diagnoses. I have AFib, which is associated with increased risk of stroke, heart failure, blood clots, and even death. Congestive heart failure. The heart can't pump enough blood to meet the body's needs. It's the heart's muscle that is the problem. The mitral valve and the aortic valve stenosis. This is the narrowing of the valve between the two heart chambers. The narrowed valve reduces or blocks the blood flow into the heart's main pumping cham chambers. And it may cause heart attack, heart failure, loss of heart function, and may cause too much fluid to build up around the heart, and the list goes on. And it goes on and on and on. Remember Jesus telling us in John 10.10, that the thief, he comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come, Jesus says, that you may have life and have it more to the full and more abundantly. The mitral valve was replaced back in 2010 by way of open heart surgery. Open heart surgery is the recommended, is recommended for the valve replacement, but due to my health issues and my age, doctors decided the open heart was out of the question. But God, we serve a God that is infinitely loving, infinitely full of wisdom, and he knows the plans he has for you. He knows the plan he had for me. But God, in his love for me, he had brought the name of this young female surgeon who excelled in valve replacement going through the groin. Only God. She's the only doctor in this area that does that. Here was the answer to our problem, we thought. She accepted me as a patient, and of course there, she, her, there was her list of tests that needed to be completed before she could, could proceed. This is when our battle with the enemy began. Remember, Jesus says the enemy is here to try to kill, to steal, and destroy. In John 16, 33, Jesus says, I told you these things so that in me you may have peace. But why? Because in this world you will have troubles, lots of troubles. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus was telling his disciples to take courage. Why? Because in spite of the inevitable struggles they will face throughout their lifetime, they will not be alone. Remember, Romans 8.37 tells us that in all things, in all our struggles throughout our lifetime, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. I don't remember the name of the very first test the surgeon had ordered before, but the enemy had already stuck his nose there and the technician discovered a blood clot in my lung causing the valve replacement to be put off indefinitely. I also saw, suffered from periodic gout attacks. After one of my doctor's lab reports, it discovered that there was an infection in the bone and one of my toes and the toe would need to be amputated. The devil just wouldn't quit. He just wouldn't stop. Upon hearing the diagnosis, the surgeon says the valve replacement would need to be put on hold again because of the fear of the inf infection spreading to the heart. So here again, the devil was able to put surgery off for another month or two. Then there was a blood clot in my leg, a clot in my lung, and they found a blood clot in my heart. Then there was the episode of bleeding that put me in the hospital again, three different hospitals at one time. They kept transporting me from one hospital to another. After all of our attempts to get this valve replaced failed, 
I found myself becoming very discouraged, disappointed and left with feelings of, will I ever be able to get this done? Here I was struggling again to keep myself from going into a state of despair. It was here where we picked up the sword of the spirit, God's word, and start doing battle with the enemy. Remember our faith will never rise above your confession. God's word tells us to resist the devil and he must flee. Find the appropriate verse of, in scripture and begin to do battle against the enemy and he has got to run. There is power and authority in the word of God. Now, if you would turn to Ephesians 6 in your Bibles, let me read it. So finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the power of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And why would we want to do this? Because we remember what Romans 8.37 tells us. In all these things, in all the struggles of life, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, why do you suppose our God is giving us instructions on what to do in the midst of a battle? Very simply, because our God, he knew, he knew that you and I were to be in a constant spiritual war with the devil. God knew we were going to be tempted to, uh, to step over the line and do the devil's bidding. But look at verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which again is the word of God. Notice that the sword of the spirit is the only offensive weapon in the believer's armor. This weapon is not necessarily entirely book of the Bible as a whole, but rather a specific word of God that needs to be spoken in and about a specific situation in your life. In order to have the precise word ready when needed, we, as believers, must know his Bible intimately. Why? 2 Corinthians 10.3 tells us, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they are divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The power of God's word hidden in your heart is the greatest defense any of us can have in a spiritual battle with the enemy. Turn now to Luke 4. I'd like all of us to read Luke 4 if we can. Luke 4, we see God's word in action. Here Jesus is just had just been led into the desert by the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is about to be tempted by the devil. Now remember, Jesus had just been baptized, right? He's just been baptized. Now he's been sent into the desert to be tempted. Jesus is showing us by example just how to do battle against the enemy using God's word. We will see that Jesus' response to all of the devil's temptation was to quote the word of God showing us the power scripture has in battling the enemy and his temptations. Jesus' experience here in the desert serves as a pattern for us to use in spiritual warfare, showing, how, showing us how to defeat Satan by using God's word. Now, very quickly, Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit 
returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered him and said, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall not worship, you shall, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you and in their hand they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until the opportune time. There is a perfect example of how we should use God's word. Temptations are real. God's word has power. God's word has authority. God's word has healing. We are to use God's word as a sword. The power of God's word is hidden in my heart. It's the greatest defense any of us can have in a spiritual battle with the enemy. We will see that Jesus' response to all of the devil's temptation was to quote the word of God, showing us the power scripture has in battling the enemy and his temptations. Jesus' experience here in the desert serves as a pattern for us to use in spiritual warfare. Showing, how, showing us how to defeat Satan by the use of God's word. Knowing and obeying God's word is an effective weapon against temptation. The word is the only offensive weapon provided in the Christian's armor. Jesus used scripture to counter Satan's attack, and so should we. But to use it effectively, we must have belief in it, have faith in God's promises. Why? because Satan also knows scripture and he's adapt to twisting it to suit his purposes. Obeying the scriptures is more important than simply having a verse to quote. So read God's word daily and apply God's word to your life as well. Then your sword will always be sharp. Now, on February 25th, 2024, my team of doctors came into my hospital room and told me that they had scheduled surgery for the next day. February 26, 2024, all the doctors would be on board witnessing the surgery because the doctors had told me that they, they were ready for a massive heart attack. They were ready for me to die on the table. On February 27, 2024, Dr. Thompson and Dr. Alou came into the hospital room to give me the good news that it all went well but they were prepared for that massive heart attack that never happened because our God, my God, he was with me. He never lived, left me, never forsake me. And his hand was on me, protecting me. And his angels encamped around that surgical suite and cleansed out everything that was not of God. And the, our, my God gave the doctors wisdom I gave the doctors knowledge that when they operated on a child of the king of kings, everything was done properly and normally. Finally, two and a half years, wait was over. Thanks be to God. Amen. Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for your, oh God, your sweetness. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your thoughtfulness, Lord. Father, your word never goes void. It always accomplishes what you send it out to do. And Father, we just thank you. Thank you that you protect and you guide and you bless beyond their wildest imaginations everyone here in this room. 
Bless them, Father. Open their eyes that they might see what you have for them and what you do for them, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. I wrote down some things, and we're going to go over them. We'll, we'll do them next week, but we only have just a second. But I will read them to you real fast about Moses. We're going to study Moses for a few weeks. And I want you to remember this, if you don't remember anything else I say today. Moses started out a basket case. <laughs> There's hope for you. Moses' upbringing was in a royal palace, but he didn't grow up with his own mom and daddy. Did he? He was adopted. Hello. His mama didn't name him. An Egyptian princess named him. I don't know why people say they don't know how Moses didn't know about his heritage. Well, he knew about his heritage with his name. His name was Moses. I found you in the water. Don't you think he ever asked why he was named Moses? Hello. Moses' life was marked by Pharaoh's persecution of the Israelites. He watched all that happen. Are we seeing stuff in the world today that's miserable to watch? But do we know the end of the story? See, I like knowing the end of the story. We win. Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in both speech and action. Do you understand that from the time Moses was born, he was fitly put where God wanted him to be to become the man God needed him to be because God knew in the tapestry where he needed to place him. Amen? You may not at all understand your tapestry right now. You may feel like a basket case. You may feel like a string. But God's got you in the picture. And God knows where you're supposed to be in the... Moses knew he was an Israelite. Moses killed a man and tried to conceal it. I know people who are judgmental about murderers who get saved. Are you judgmental about Moses? He killed a man and tried to bury him in the sand. And he looked both ways to see if anybody was watching him. What a hypocrite, right? Okay. Moses was a runaway fugitive. He ran. Get out. Moses married a Midianite woman. I love this. He married Zipporah, but he went to the land of Midian. Do you know who owned the land of Midian? Abraham married for the second time. Do y'all remember that? Abraham married Betur and had more children. Well, one of his one of the children that they had, they named Midian. And where Moses went and hung out for 40 years was in the land of the Midianite. If you think God does not have a plan for your life, study Moses. He married a Midianite woman, Zipporah. Moses lived in the wilderness how many years? 40 years. Some of you whine because you've been in the wilderness two weeks. 40 years, people. Moses went from being a prince to a shepherd to sheep he did not own. He was a shepherd for his father-in-law. He went from a high to what was considered shepherds were considered the lowest, the lowest of the land. Look at Jesus when the shepherds, they all, that was incredible that the angels were feared to the shepherds because they were considered the dregs of the earth, right? Moses tended his father-in-law. But while Moses was tending his father-in-law's sheep, he learned to live in the wilderness. The Bible tells us in whatsoever state we find ourselves, be, be content to be at peace, to be at, in a happy place. Not, why you got me here, Lord? To be content, to find the job God's got you to do where he places you. To have joy in the job God's called you to do. Once you go to Hebrews 3 and we're going to... We are going to really enjoy these lessons. And a lot of people say, Jeannie, why Old Testament? People, Old Testament is good stuff. I've learned so much from my grandparents, people that I know, from the people that I've, that I've watched as I've grown up. I've learned so much from Miss Pat and Brother Don. I've watched their faithfulness. Amen? The Bible tells us to see those people on the road a little bit ahead of us. Miss Pat had taught for me for what, three or four years. Miss Pat was my substitute in the Sunday school. I've watched the lives of people that are on the road with me. Watch what the Word of God is teaching you. So Hebrews chapter 3, start with verse. And so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus, whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. For he was faithful to God, who appointed him, just as Moses served faithfully 
when he was entrusted for the God's entire house. But Jesus deserves more glory than Moses. Just as a person who builds a house deserves more praise than the house itself. For every house has a builder, but the one who built everything is Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truth God would reveal later. But Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire house, and we are God's house. If we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope, be confident. The Bible says don't look left and don't look right. My interpretation of that is don't read the news and worry about it, worry about it. The Bible says look up for our redemption drawing nigh. And he started out with Moses and he was a basket case. And if he can use Moses, he can use. Father, we thank you for this lesson. And we thank you for this past testimony. We thank you that you spared her life, Father, that she could remain with us, Father. Father, you say that the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered by the Lord. And we believe everything was said and done here was ordered this morning for our lives for our encouragement. Father, you speak wisdom into our lives, and we just give you glory. We give you glory, honor, and praise. We thank you, Father, that we're in the palm of your hand, and it is the most glorious, happy, and safe place to be in. Thank y'all. On behalf of our pastor and staff here at OAG, we want to say thank you. Thank you for being a part of our ministry. We are grateful for you and the support you give our church and its ministries so that we can continue to do what God has called us to do, to be the family church for the family of God. For more content from Pastor Strickland and Oxford Assembly of God, check out our media website at oag.church/media.